abandoned in place. It might just sound like some simple phrase of civil engineering, but in Cape Canaveral, located on Florida's eastern coast, it makes for a grim reminder of a distant but glorious past. Over 60 years ago, at Launch Complexes 39A and B, the Apollo astronauts began their journey toward the moon, a testament to human ambition and ingenuity. But over time, the fervor for space exploration has ebbed and flowed, and as the world's moved on, so did the funding for places like Cape Canaveral. This is the result. Structures that once buzzed with activity are reduced to silent ruins. Today, it's almost like we're in a new commercial space age. Companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin are reactivating trips to space, as well as the grounds and launch pads of Cape Canaveral. But NASA continues to have to make extremely difficult decisions that leads to the demolition of its historic structures. And in the midst of all this is the Merritt Island National Refuge, one of Florida's last untamed beaches, a sanctuary spanning 140,000 acres that have been protected since 1963 through an interagency agreement between the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and NASA. Cape Canaveral sits at the turbulent crossroads of history, innovation, and nature. It serves as a poignant reminder that sometimes the past and the future coexist in some pretty unexpected places, while offering a perfect place for seeing policy failures in action. Ultimately, Cape Canaveral is then, in a sense, a microcosm of broader social patterns of inspiration, aspiration, achievement, and then maybe apathy. And I think we can learn a lot by understanding its history, the kinds of decisions that got us to where we are, and how to appreciate what we have, where we've been, and where we're headed. Cape Canaveral's legacy in rocket launches didn't actually begin with NASA. Back in the late 1940s, before the dawn of the space age, the U.S. military saw potential in the isolated coastline. They began testing rockets here, drawn to the location not just for its seclusion, but for its strategic positioning near the equator. This is a detail that offers a valuable boost for eastward launching rockets. By 1958, the stakes were raised even higher. The Cold War was in full swing, and the race to space between the U.S. and the Soviet Union was heating up. Enter NASA. From its inception, the Cape Canaveral was at the heart of America's ambitious space pursuits. It marked the departure point for Alan Shepard's historic 1961 Freedom 7 flight, soon followed by a succession of Mercury missions carrying astronauts. The Gemini program, too, made its home at the Cape. It was a program with a vital purpose setting the stage for targeting the moon by rehearsing the complexities of space operations, from rendezvous to spacewalks. But it was during the Apollo era of the 1960s that the Cape Canaveral really took its shape. On its shores, launch complexes sprouted across the horizon as the nation's drive to reach the moon intensified. In the following years, the ever-evolving Cape landscape bore witness to countless technological upgrades, each spurred by a mixture of Cold War competition and patriotism. And while Cape Canaveral played host to pivotal Apollo missions like Apollo 7, it was actually its immediate neighbor, the Kennedy Space Center, that provided the foundation and infrastructure for the lunar landings, crafted especially for the enormous Saturn V rocket. Ignition sequence start. During this burst of innovation, human engineering and the local nature of the Cape were sometimes at odds with one another. Ecosystems were disturbed, marshes repurposed, and coastlines reshaped. Yet pockets of preservation remained and presented a striking image of rockets ascending with untouched beaches and sanctuaries as their backdrop. But like all intense moments in history, the moment of the space race simmered. As we transitioned from the Apollo era to the waning years of the shuttle program, Cape Canaveral, once buzzing with activity, began showing visible signs of stagnation and neglect. The combination of shifting political priorities, technological advancements, and economic challenges meant that many of the facilities were obsolete. Unused launch pads began rusting away, control centers were mothballed, and the vast tracts of infrastructure laid in a state of decay. When looking across the Kennedy Space Center today, you're observing more than just buildings. You're seeing layers of history unfolded before you. The Vehicle Assembly Building, erected in 1966, stands as a lasting monument to the Apollo era. Its external facade has remained largely unchanged as a kind of historical snapshot, while the interior, on the other hand, is a result of a sequence of renovations that keep pace with modern technology. As the ninth largest federal government property holder, NASA owns over 100,000 acres of land, encompassing more than 6,000 buildings and structures. This vast expanse amounts to an estimated replacement value of $40 billion. But much of this infrastructure was laid down during that Apollo boom, and it was built with only a design life of around 20 to 40 years. 
By Nest's own accounts, 75% of their infrastructure is now past its prime, leading to deferred maintenance costs soaring to $2.66 billion by 2020. At the helm of this property empire is the facilities and real estate division known as FRED. Their policies emphasize repurposing existing assets, only venturing into new constructions when it's deemed cost-effective. But there's an interesting caveat here that for every new construction, in older space, 125% of the new must be retired. While this all sounds prudent, take the case of the original Kennedy Space Center headquarters designed by famed architect Charles Luckman in 1965. Its design was a kind of architectural nod to Mies van der Rohe's signature style that you'll find all over Chicago. From this building, much of the administrative work of the Apollo missions was conducted. By the year 2000, its historical and architectural significance secured it a spot on the U.S. National Register of Historic Places. But by 2019, the building stood vacant, with prospects for its renovation dimmed by its challenging state of decaying materials, increasing power costs, and lurking dangers of asbestos lining its walls. Now, a new building stands right next to the site of its predecessor, it's half the size of the original, and many of its offices were designed to mimic the ones that it replaced. A similar fate befell the Mercury Control Center. Despite its historic importance, the $6 million price tag attached to its restoration led to a painful decision, preserve the essential equipment, but demolish the building itself. In 1999, the consoles, displays, and the other equipment were moved to the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. The flight control area, the heart of the mission control operation, has been faithfully preserved for future generations. Between 2015 and 2020, such decisions led to the demolition of 449 NASA structures. Alarmingly, 11% of these were declared historic structures. The preference for constructing new over refurbishing the old often stems from the allure of the predictable. New structures lack the complication and baggage of their older counterparts, and in the complicated reality of bureaucracy and funding, it's often just simpler to advocate for the simplicity of just building new rather than championing the refurbishment of older structures. If you peel back the layers of NASA's operations, you'll quickly notice a pretty questionable pattern. Unlike most agencies that centralize their efforts, NASA operates with a distinctly decentralized model. Each of its centers dot the nation and operate largely independently from one another, with distinct roles for each carved out by their expertise and decades spent specializing in a piece of NASA's larger mission. Every fiscal year, the U.S. government allocates NASA's budget. NASA then methodically divides it among these centers, with funding tailored to the individual projects and missions that they're stewarding. With this funding, then, the centers enjoy a certain degree of autonomy, channeling resources in ways that they believe best supports their objectives. Now, while this might sound efficient on the surface, internal audits by NASA reveal some unintended consequences. Centers that are driven by competition with other centers often develop projects and technology in isolation, sometimes overlooking similar capabilities elsewhere within NASA's network. This not only leads to duplication, but also ties up resources and facilities that might be redundant or lack a clear mission. With hopes of attracting more projects for itself, a center will take risks with a build-it-and-they-will-come attitude and then divert funds that are meant for facility maintenance or office upgrades. Instead, they pour these funds into specialized high-tech projects, projects that might not have gotten the green light from NASA's central administration. The strategic allocation might foster innovation sometimes, but it also means less attention to some of NASA's core infrastructural needs. Instead of general repairs or broader scale upgrades, the money often finds its way into niche testing and development facilities. It's a balancing act, of course, where NASA's quest for the cutting edge sometimes comes at the cost of its foundational support systems. NASA's attitude toward building is similar to how they treat their technological constructions. Once a piece of equipment has just served its mission, it then falls into obsolescence. Shockingly, to me at least, the same approach is applied to NASA's historic buildings and its preserved terrains, and I think that this mindset has a number of risks. Thinkers like Anton Picon contemplate places like this, which he calls anxious landscapes. He poetically describes the unique eerie emotions that these kinds of places evoke in visitors and onlookers. Constantly functioning infrastructure and landscapes degrade over time just due to their productive nature, becoming, as Picon puts it, worn out and unuseful. A visitor might note the rusted, dilapidated structures that seem tainted beyond repair paradoxically remain strangely fascinating, if not off-putting. A sense of unease might stem from feelings of entrapment. 
Visionary Buckminster Fuller often likened our planet to a spaceship with humanity aboard with no escape hatch. The blue marble photograph from the Apollo missions helps visually cement this mental construct in our minds, reinforcing Earth's vulnerability amidst the vast expanse of space. At Cape Canaveral, technology merges seamlessly with the environment. It's almost impossible to isolate monumental feats of human engineering from the encroaching natural elements that are reclaiming them. There aren't simply ruins here, instead they resemble remnants of a past ambition, echoing their previous grandeur while standing as testaments to the unrelenting march of time. Look, I love NASA and all things space related, so this shouldn't be seen as some damning criticism. Instead, I think that this situation puts a kind of global set of issues into really sharp focus. Cape Canaveral chronicles both our triumphant moments, our systematic challenges, and our fleeting missteps. The landscape stirs a blend of reverence for the past and contemplations of our present trajectory. Nature's untouched splendor stands juxtaposed against relics from a time when humanity's gaze was fixed squarely upward. This is a place where nature and technology come together, and these aging structures, now scarred by time, were once symbols of hope and resilience. The ongoing challenges faced by NASA include how it's funded as well as how it manages its infrastructure. The tug of war between preserving history and forging ahead mirrors larger societal debates. As we embrace the future, what markers of our past do we keep and which do we just abandon in place? In preparation for this video, I brushed up on the science of space to better understand rockets and their impact. And I was able to do this in the most engaging and entertaining way possible over on Brilliant.org in their astrophysics course. Brilliant walked me through a series of explorations about the behavior of gases and gravity. Lessons are so well designed, they feel like a video game. You can play with the equations and then just watch the physics unfold. It really helped sharpen my thinking around the physics of celestial bodies. All this is what makes Brilliant great. It keeps me sharp while exploring the world on my own time, like a personal learning coach. Continuous learning is essential for my career and I'm sure yours too. And since you're watching this, you're also probably just curious about the world and would like to stay up to date on the latest innovations. Brilliant makes it super easy to build a daily learning habit to keep us mentally sharp. Its visual, hands-on approach is such an effective and engaging way to master the concepts behind today's technology. And you can do it anywhere on all sorts of devices. I'll start one on my computer in between editing videos, and then maybe I'll just pick it up later on my phone. Brilliant was built for busy people like us with bite-sized lessons that break down important concepts into understandable pieces and parts. And they have thousands of lessons to choose from, from foundational and advanced math, to AI, data science, neural networks, and more, with new lessons added every single month. To try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash Stuart Hicks, or just click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off of Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Enjoy.